Hey there, welcome to Spectrum Pulse, where we talk about music, movies, art, and culture. And now it's time for the year-end list. We're going to have to start with the biggest, the top 10 worst hit songs of 2023. So in previous years, I've highlighted an emotional response in my worst list. In 2020, it was disgust. 2021, it was embarrassment. 2022, it was sheer dumbfounded amazement that such disasters as songs got big enough to be hailed as among the biggest of the year. And that produces different attitudes when approaching and making a year-end list. There just isn't the need to be as angry because while the songs might be truly terrible, the emotion provides some different context. In 2023, I was not so lucky. The anger is back, folks. If anything, it felt like there was a monkey's paw hanging over the entire Hot 100 this entire year specifically to bait me. You didn't think pop was particularly strong or special last year? Now watch it dry into a desperately forgettable husk recycling entire too many old hits. You wish that rap would pull itself together and in the mainstream, it had one of the, its worst down years in recent memory. You hoped that r and would get more moving, and once again, the results are haphazard at best. You might be finally getting a handle on reggaeton, so now here is the regional Mexican sound, which routinely had worse production, and of which you only started getting midway through the year to rather mixed results. And after a year where so many country songs made your favorites, your best of 2022, you could see the genre going into a new era of unparalleled success that has been decades in the making. You get some of the worst country songs and discourse of recent memory, because of course you do. But most notably, 2023 was finally the year that I had enough with Billboard. Honestly, should have come sooner. It's not like the publication hasn't earned the scorn that I have thrown at it the past, well, decade or so as the unofficial public relations arm of the record labels in order to provide a facade of legitimacy to all of their bullshit. But in a year where their events planning division took control to synchronize the year-end list with the timing of the Billboard Music Awards, which even further screws up their tracking year for the sake of an award show that, again, nobody watches, nobody really cares that much about, I had enough. So in working with my comrades to talk of the charts, we produced a 200-song year-end list that was frankly better aligned with where Billboard should have ended their year-end, from early December 2022 to end in late November 2023. I'm probably going to use this list structure going forward. Not only does it allow me to finally get around the Christmas glut and a lot of songs that long outlasted their welcome year over year, it also allows me to be more consistent, whereas a record-keeping entity, apparently Billboard does not appear to value to the same extent. It also allowed me to better sample songs that would likely have been caught late in the year and just not accumulated enough longevity, or potentially songs that had more cultural impact than the industry push would properly recognize. Ergo, if you're curious about what have made the, say, the worst list in 2022 under these conditions, well, uh, here you go. Have fun. Now, when it comes to the decade list situation, I don't know if I'm still doing this in seven years. Well, we'll burn that bridge when we get to it. I'll figure out what the hell I'm working with then. But this also means that I'm going to have a slightly expanded list of our dishonorable mentions, which, for the record, they're in no particular order, but they all find rather unique ways to piss me off. And we're going to start with a bit of a curveball here. I could have my Gucci on. I go in my Louis Vuitton. But even with nothing on, that I made you look, I made you look. I'll be honest, I, I didn't hate it when it dropped. And I feel like I should have. Megan Trainer was responsible for some of the most shrink-wrapped and regressive music of the mid-2010s, emblematic of a retro craze that has aged haphazardly at best. Her comeback should have really pissed me off. But let's be real. This was on the back of TikTok and screamed a fluke novelty. Sterile, clunky, riddled with brand names, playing to the exact same tacky white bread appropriation of rap slang that she was pushing nine years ago, where the formula is so goddamn obvious it can't even be good camp. It's too calculated. But nobody really cared beyond the one song. She hasn't seen another hit since. And while her 2022 album sold alarmingly better than you might expect. Nobody's coming back for more of this cake. Good riddance. Whereas 
says, I have never liked this songs, and my reasons why have only deepened across the course of 2023, starting with the realization of, oh, this is why y'all hated Bozzy in the late 2010s. I get it now. But this is also so much worse. The sort of shrink rap, sterile prettiness with the juxtaposition of the frankly embarrassing rap verses with that grand glittery hook is trying for romantic bombast and has neither subtlety nor tact. The song references Frank Ocean's blonde in the second line and doesn't come close to appropriating that vibe. I don't even love blonde like that, but I take that over this. And while I could reference the god-awful music video and make the very obvious Twilight joke, or how Jake has that atrocious collab with Jax that interpolates Barney the Dinosaur. I mean, what's most revealing here is how some internet sleuths are saying that the AI-generated heart on my sleeve, utilizing fake vocals from Drake and The Weeknd, was actually made by this guy as that ghostwriter. I'm not 100% sold on all the evidence, even if the work by Yokai was really well-assembled trying to show it all and debunk this guy. But you know what? The same cheap, hollow disposability hangs over all this, too. It would not remotely surprise me if it was the case. But on the topic of some cheap hackery... I'll be honest Looking at you got me thinking nonsense Caught was in my stomach when you walk in When you got your arms around me Oh, it feels so good I had to jump the octave Oh god, I I've got more history with Sabrina Carpenter than frankly any music critic should. I've been reviewing this woman since 2018. I have given her multiple chances to rise above the basic small-scale pop dreck, and I have pissed off her fanbase multiple times. But you know what, to her credit, this song actually has a new idea to it. Being meta about the process of making a nonsense song. Now normally I'm a sucker for meta commentary in music, that's why I've given 21 Pilots entirely too many chances, but where they use it to elevate intensify their themes. Sabrina Carpenter is using it for a bunch of cutesy jokes and piss takes where she's not even sure she would leave any of it in, and yet of course she does. Because who cares? It's an obvious studio goof-off. It's her fun style. I mean, the one good joke here is that she's got to jump the octave, but that only amplifies Carpenter's shrill keening against the limp guitar lick and the leaden percussion in the cheapest of Ariana Grande imitations outside of Madison Beer. But again, I get why some folks might find this charming. But then Olivia Rodrigo made Bad Idea Right, which plays the central conceit of having a brain fart in the face of newfound attraction, and actually has some dramatic stakes and teeth with a way better performance and production, and I knew we certainly did not need this badly produced pop knockoff. But you know what, speaking of knockoffs... I'm good, yeah, I'm feeling alright, baby, I'ma have the best fucking night of my life, and we're takes me i'm down for the ride baby don't you know i'm good yeah i'm feeling all right again this is another song where i just cannot hate it as much as some do and even if i could have made it onto my worst list in 2022 i doubt it would have gotten that high does david Guetta's hollow edm groove sound both stiff and hopelessly compressed do bb rex's lyrics sound like an amateurish first draft and her vocals predominantly in a minor key utterly fail to convey any sort of good time happening against one of the most oversold earworm melodies that sample from Eiffel 65? I mean, yeah, we all knew this. The absence of good, it's palpable. But it's also where I feel like there needs to be a little more to just get under my skin than just all the vacant emptiness where this desperate ploy for chart attention and another 15 minutes of fame has already been revealed for what it is. It's not like BB Rexa was able to really follow through on it. Her self-titled album this year Year, it tanked to the surprise of nobody, and the career revival of David Guetta only really translated to one more obvious sample with Baby Don't Hurt Me, with Anne Marie showing even less personality than usual, and Coy Ray really phoning it in. That was the last song that was cut from this dishonorable mentions, just so you know. And you know, while we're talking about Coy Ray, Yeah, cause girls is players too. Uh, yeah, yeah, cause girls is players too. Keep playing, baby. Cause girls is players too. Bitches 
Making money all around the world, cause girls is players too. So for a significant chunk of this year, the sheer disappointment I had with players was gonna place it on my worst list proper. I stuck up for Coyle Ray. I actually thought she had some legit talent as a rapper back in 2021. Instead, she chooses to triple down on the obvious gaudy sampling on that sophomore album that only exposed just how hollow and lacking in new ideas she and her handlers were. And again, the issue is not the obvious sampling in and of itself, so much as finding a new twist or interpolation beyond just a Family Guy reference callback. And she was far from the worst in 2023, as y'all will soon see. To her credit, Coyle Ray's flip of the message, it could have worked, maybe. And I'm not even against the Biggie callback on the second verse, but this synth groove in this form is way too stiff to give her any tangible foundation. And that's before we get to the lines about her going from rags to riches that are just as bullshit as when Drake did it 10 years ago and started from the bottom. Your Benzino's daughter even if there's conflict between you it's been a topic in your own music this does not help your case of selling something you cannot back up now granted when you hear that Coyle Ray actually freestyled this song all in one take, well, I buy it, it's certainly believable, and that a Jersey Club remix off of TikTok was ultimately responsible for making this a thing. I mean, shame that she chose this approach for that album this year that also tanked. I mean, I'm not even surprised. I'm not even that mad anymore. I'm just disappointed. <laughs> Uh, Alright, look, I can accept that the regional Mexican sound probably is just not for me. The underproduced live sound actively makes the rickety grooves a lot worse, and when you translate the lyrics, they often come across as horny and banal as any mainstream trap or reggaeton. That being said, I've heard more than most this year, as in I tried to hear multiple albums in this subgenre beyond just what got fed through the TikTok algorithm, and I actually found acts I can like. And for the rest, even if I could tell more of them apart, they probably would not make this list. And yet I'm very confident in saying that Fuerza Regida are among some of the absolute worst here, where they might have a little bit more flavor, but it only winds up making them sound so much more obnoxious. Of their solo hits this year, this one might have been better produced in that the farty horns and brittle acoustics, they sound a little bit fuller, but then all the horny flexes are paired with a passing jab at Peza Pluma for actually hesitating if being asked to shoot someone. Look, Ferreza Regina, they do not have that problem. This entire song screams of unloading too soon. You know, if you catch my drift there. Last night we let the liquor talk. I can't remember everything we said, but we said it all. You told me that you wish I was somebody you never met. But baby, baby, something's telling me this ain't over yet. <sighs> song of the year, folks. Because if we weren't going to get a Maroon 5 hit in 2023, might as well get the country trap imitation of their gutlessly bland pop crossover years with all the bad rapping, smug presumptuousness, and non-sex appeal that it has. It's actually a little alarming how much of the heartfelt romance that Morgan Wallen used to sell has just evaporated for this album cycle for a song about as miserable as the relationship described within it. This would have been higher on my list, but... Look, we all know Morgan Wallen had worse this year. Stay tuned. Yeah, a bit of a curveball with this one. It, okay, look, I like Jelly Roll's story. Son of a Sinner is a really good song, and I'm genuinely happy he got out of that unkempt pocket of country rap that's got some really ugly undertones. He's got multiple songs with Adam Calhoun. If you know, you know. But if you also know your country rock, Need a Favor is just lousy. A sour and demanding song that comes across less desperate for God's help in times of strife and trauma, and more like he's shaking down someone who owes him money. But I can also imagine how this could have worked. It might have just been fumbled in the execution. This was the only song that Austin Navarro produced on this album, and I'm sorry, he cannot deliver the muscle this really needs in the low end, or seriously ramp up that gospel bombast. It feels very filmy and underpowered, which doesn't pay off any of the texture in Jelly Roll voice, one of his biggest traits. So as a follow-up single for Son of a Sinner, it killed any serious hype I had for Jelly Roll. Haven't really been all that impressed with anything he's put out since. 
We'll have to see here. Me dicen te cueme cuando ven el meme voy partiendo el queso de JGL Siempre oloroso le lavo me quiere haciendo feria con sin nadie va ni viene And yes, that is two duds for Fuerza Regida, where I would say there is nothing so egregious as that passing shot at Pesa Pluma for no good reason, amidst all the brand name porn and horny flexing, and the passing reference to real life Mexican drug cartels in which they have pledged their allegiance. I mean, more of it funds the music industry in all genres than you know, folks. Until I saw that line that when translated is a shout out to Travis Scott for him to bring me Kylie. So I had to check to see if Kylie Jenner and Travis Scott were still together. Apparently they're not beyond co-parenting. So it's likely more that they're using her name as a metaphor for cocaine, which might be the only explanation for why the horn pickups sound like the out close aftermath of a colonoscopy, but with added reverb. Again, there are acts I think are passable in this regional Mexican scene. I'm not even gonna call it a trend, even if there's no guarantee these acts maintain their mainstream crossover in the US. But given that one of the biggest acts to cross over was Fuerza Regida, I don't have high hopes. Slut me out, slut me out, slut, slut, slut. Oh, I bet a whole lot of you expected this to be on the list proper and probably pretty high, especially once you realize that it was eligible when I expanded my list criteria. And let me make this clear. This was the last cut. This song is terrible. An abbreviated whooshing embarrassment where Enelie Choppa tries to be sexual and fails so catastrophically that anyone taking pointers from this in the bedroom should have their heads examined and then sue for professional negligence. It is the sort of sex song that is so disgustingly ridiculous in its provocation. Eat the dick like you was ugly, putting his dick, which he tells her to climb like a ladder, into her kidneys, wanting her ass in his face so long that he gets pink eye, fucking everywhere from the church to the basketball game, shooting a shot as you will, saying that his cum tastes like sugar gravy because he's a vegan, but he doesn't come quick because he controls his bladder, as he says that all coochies matter. I I'm sorry, even the diehard fans on Genius thought this was so out of pocket. On all of that alone, it would be a lock for a high spot. Nobody can possibly take this seriously. Then I realized the over-the-top absurdity, it's always been NLE Choppa's trademark whenever his ridiculous bullshit has made one of my lists before. He's like Lil Wayne, but with less talent or 2 chains with way less dignity. And in a year where the worst songs actually pissed me off, a cut that feels like a dare to make the least appealing sex song to chart that actually kind of makes me laugh instead. I, I can't in good consciousness say that it's remotely good. I'm not fully convinced Enelie Chop is in on the joke here. Again, the first leak of this song happened when he was on stream with Aiden Ross, and there are leagues separating this from WAP in more ways than one, but I'm sorry, I tried. I can't hate this. I don't like it. I won't listen to it outside this year. But look, in 2023, there are bigger problems than this. And that's our dishonorable mentions. I bet there's some surprises there. Now onto the meat of this list, the truly reprehensible stuff. Number 10. I'm tired of dancing around this. Utopia by Travis Scott was lousy. This was one of the biggest reasons why. Bitch! Now, for some of you who didn't see my review of Utopia, might think that's a little unfair or out of left field. I mean, it's a big redemptive comeback that sounds so experimental, providing you didn't hear Yeezus or recognize any of the song fragments from when they have leaked the past five plus years. And you know what? Who really cares about Travis Scott saying anything or deserving any sort of redemption? It's all about getting hyped, curating the vibe. That's all that matters. Well, I'm sorry. The vibe curated here is utterly rancid with the goopy rage since the story stock trap percussion, and Playboy Cardi sounding like a Muppet with COVID and perhaps his worst and least effective vocal choices to date. I know a couple Cardi fans, they don't even like this. And that's not to mention Travis Scott's own bleeding of the word fiend all over the hook like a minion. It's not even the word fiend. It's a hackneyed fragment like the rest of the song. And for as much as Travis is trying to imply so much is at stake here for his career, in 
imply some form of menace. By appropriating rage music for some attempt to catch up with the kids, he gave the game away. This isn't creating a new sound. It's the overcooked leftovers of a sound that only barely works in a mosh pit with his collaborator apparently suffering mid-asthma attack. Neither of these guys are interesting nor fiery enough on the mic to make this worth hearing outside of seeing them live. And even knowing Travis's reputation, having seen him live twice already, uh, yeah, this isn't worth the hell that it wants to summon. Number nine. And you know, speaking of songs, I sound like sludgy, curdled ass. Ain't that some bad cone buddies in the field, mud on the wheels, yeah. Ain't that some thick smoke, Silverado tearing up a two-lane road. Ain't that some C-O-U-N-T-R-Y, shit we've been doing since we was yay high. There's folks out there ain't T-R-Y, this man. Ain't that some shit. I have said before that Morgan Wallen is at his worst when he draws on the stale bro country cliches. And while this year he tested that theory even for Further, this is probably the worst example. And if you've seen my Bro Country video essay, please go check it out. It's actually really good. It should be no surprise why this is a total migraine for me. The oily electric guitar is suffocated behind the brittle acoustics and the dull percussion. The entire song just sounds sickly, especially alongside Wallen's process squawking as he rattles through all the country cliches and brand names because that's just how it is in the South. Where on the second verse, he even acknowledges how cliche all of this is. Of course, there is a certain irony that Morgan Wallen did not write this song at all. Maybe that's the excuse for the clunky spelling gimmick that breaks down entirely the second time they try it. Oh, I'm sorry, T-R-Y'd it. Or for all the mediocre rapping. But you know what? Let's go back to what I've talked about that works in bro country. A light touch. Good times partying, not this sour defensive slurry. I can't quite say it's the worst Morgan Wallen song we have here, stay tuned, but on a 36 song album, of which maybe a quarter was worth salvaging, the fact this didn't get cut, it's gross. To answer the metaphorical question of this song, it is indeed some shit. Number eight. All right, look, I've seen enough Rage Acts live at this point at festivals to get their appeal. It's about the communal pit experience. The more ragged and slapdash it is, the more the sound makes sense. It's the whole SoundCloud rap paradigm. Probably it's never going to work for me, given that I grew up in the late 90s and 2000s, and a slew of rappers who brought in a little bit more baritone presence on both the record and live than any of these Rage Acts can credibly sell, to say nothing of, you know, actual content. Not really the issue here. No, I actually kind of feel bad because this is the same as any new upstart subgenre. Eventually, you're going to get watered down and co-opted by the acts who are utterly out of ideas. Yeah, I don't be giving no fucks. Huh? I don't know what you call it. I don't, I don't be giving no fuck. I say whatever I want. Yeah, I do whatever I want. I kind of money for fun. You know, popping me purge for fun. It's very telling to me that the Yeet fans I know don't really seem to like this, and for actually different reasons too. Some for how Yeet sounds on it, I see their point, after a really pretty piano buildup nakedly sampled from Azimuth for nearly a minute long, we get a non-transition to a checked out Yeet swallowed in buzzed out chiptune goop that occasionally makes him sound like Donald Duck, but otherwise like young thug but without any power or creativity in any of his flexing, but some hate it for how Drake's verse is just ass. And yeah, it is. I hope to God the stay with the O-lines are freestyled and not something that Drake thought was remotely clever alongside that lightsaber line that only barely makes sense. But it's also about as bad as him trying to match Yeet's energy and then take over part of the hook. It's so obvious he's fumbling all over this. Apparently this was intended as a diss to somebody jacking their style. Although why anyone would want to take this misshapen mess of a record, I don't even know, especially when they're so derivative as it is. But when you discover that apparently this was recorded around two years ago and was intended for a Yeet album, but Drake grabbed it up instead? Well, uh, yeah, that just makes all kinds of sense for an insecure rapper struggling for any way to stay relevant with the kids who probably do not want their sound this commodified and rendered this garbage. Congrats to Yeet, I guess, for getting a better hit than he will likely ever get on his own. But I also know how Drake treats all of his collaborators once he hops off their sound. You should give a fuck about that. All I'm saying. Number seven. 
I was a little shocked when assembling my list that this wound up so high. Uh, make no mistake, I have always thought this is crap, but it is a low-grade crappiness, relying on big names and trying to sell a lot of edgy provocation and commentary on the industry of fame, when in reality it's just not interesting. It's not potent enough to make any of this work. And you know, while we're on the topic of the idol... For there to be so much talent working on this, The Weeknd, Madonna, Metro Boomin, Mike Dean, even Playboy Cardi is here for some reason. He's utterly inessential on the outside of his usual empty post and bridge, which according to The Weeknd was apparently pulled in from an entire different session. But the fact that popular is such a lazy dud is something to behold here. You would think that given how much The Weeknd worships the lurid bombast of the 1980s, pairing him with Madonna should be a slam dunk and yet we got the Madonna who wants to make the glib, vapid meta commentary on the existential emptiness of fame like she was doing back in the 2000s, pairing it with the non-structure of a justify my love, and my god, I am sick of this from her. But the music might actually be the bigger issue here. The chintzy but weirdly spare synths, the gentle rattling patter of percussion, the phoned-in guitar passage before the final hook. There's no flair to this, there's no grandeur, no cinematic bombast, doesn't even sound that classy or opulent so much as office elevator music for artists so convinced of their artistic genius that they don't think that they have to care. Now, if I was giving them all way more credit than they deserve, you could argue that this brand of muted boredom is probably more representative of the reality of fame than any of the flashy parties or debauchery. Shame nobody told the songwriters that, who actually include Sam Levinson, because they're leaning on the imagery of murder and selling souls, the intoxicating rush of fame, paired with reference to running up debt, doing cam girl work even. And given that Madonna is the only woman on this song, I mean, that's skeevy, but in the cheapest and most disjointed way possible. I don't even think they thought through that implication. Now, I can say it certainly matches the show they made. Frankly, that's way more damning than any of my critique. Let's move on. Number six. One thing I found interesting about folks who will defend this in the album that it's on, it's the acknowledgement that, look, He's never going to be as good as he was. We've been lying to ourselves a lot the past seven or so years. It's at least close to what's worked for him before. Let us have this. You know what? I gave y'all a year to marinate in that. Y'all knew from at least last year that this was coming. Time's up. 21, can you do something for me? 21. Can you hit a little rich flex for me? Then 21, can you do something for me? Drop some bars to my pussy ex for me. There's a lot I can add to my short review of her loss and the excoriation I later added on Billboard Breakdown. I consider it Drake's worst album by a comfortable margin for the god-awful mixing and mastering, the pile-up of cornball lines, the now flagrant misogyny, because why even pretend to have complexity or excuses when you can just get away with it? It's what the fans want, apparently. And the very obvious desperation when plugging in 21 Savage to salvage Drake's popular momentum after the house experiment honestly never mind was something of a misfire honestly was not that bad. Hell, you get evidence of some of that with the opening that of course went viral on TikTok with Drake pathetically mewling for 21 to do something for him. I mean, to me it was just never funny. Just very revealing of the cowardice to retreat back to what he knows will work because he's got it down to a science to game streaming and he's so backed it won't even matter. He's gonna get the hits. And you know, when 21 had his verse against the watery trap menace, I was almost on board. Until, of course, he asked the girl on her period to suck his dick before the most lazy possible Megan the Stallion reference. Let's not dwell on that implication. And then the beat switches up into a leaden clunker with dull pianos and Drake's somehow off-key of them, where even if you think the acronym rhyming is clever, you get the line, I'm steady pushing P, you pushing PTSD. I'll say it again. I was done at that point, aside from being the emotional undercurrent that reflects the lived experiences of all those kids trying to get out, and of 21 Savage's most emotionally evocative work, for the record, even on this album, this song and the album often dallies in the exact same kind of violence, but is privileged enough to avoid any sense of actual consequence. Even if you accept they're playing the bad guys, reveling in it all for the sick thrill, there's no menace here. Just the reality of, if you're rich, if you're flexing, if you're a star, 
They just let you do it. If they don't, it's her loss, right? Fucking gross. Number five. So after all that, you might be surprised that this is this high. I mean, it certainly seems more innocuous. Might even be playing to a sound that I like. Produced by a guy who helped push it in the first place nearly a decade ago. Should be a slam dunk, right? Well, devil's in the details with this one. Oh, I love it and I hate it at the same time. You and I drink the poison from the same vine. Oh, I love it and I hate it at the same time. Hiding all of our sins from the daylight. It's not just that it's the obvious Hosier ripoff down to getting his original producer. It's not just that it's a Hosier ripoff in the year where Hosier puts out a new album, which might not have been great, but absolutely had enough great songs that could have charted. Hell, Eat Your Young did chart. And it's not like Hosier couldn't have charted because, you know what, thanks to Noah Kahn trying to create any vestige of cred, he brought Hosier onto his remix of Northern Attitude. It hit the Hot 100. No, no, no. It's all that, coupled to the reality that David Kushner is the worst kind of ripoff. One that found the text of the original, but misses so much of what made him special. So much of Hosier's sound is indebted to blues and soul, and takes all that religious and classical framing as an excuse to ramp up the historically accurate, horny, horny melodrama. David Kushner, meanwhile, plays this with the ponderous but clumsily sexless solemnity of being deeply rooted in religious strife that wants to sell the intensity of Christian rock, but with nothing close to actual fire or brimstone, with a substantially more basic metaphor at its core. Jelly Roll's need of favor was underpowered and sour, and to me this is so much worse than being close enough to evoke a better sound, but only the surface aesthetic that misses everything that makes the original article so special, like smothering half his overdubbed hook in a buzzy filter, or that cavernous mess of a final hook. In other words, I think I finally understand all those people who hated Take Me to Church nine years ago. I hope we see Twilight on this in record time. And you know what, now I'm just thinking that if this song had been released 15 years ago, it probably would have made the Twilight soundtrack. And made it worse because those soundtracks went way harder than they had any right to go. Getting off topic, this fucking blows. Give Hosier another proper hit, you cowards. Number four. Okay. So for the next couple of songs, there is something of an underlying theme around how they approach women. And at least for the next two, there has been some appeal to women in the past. It's one of the reasons that they've actually had the pop crossover success that they have. I'm not going to be so naive and say that they squandered all of it this year, but I mean, come on. Did you hear this shit? When you're chasing what he's drinking, are you thinking about me? When you're riding where he's driving, are you missing my street? Every time you close your eyes, tell me who do you see? When you're chasing what he's drinking, are you thinking about me? It's tough to pinpoint whether or not this is Morgan Wallen's worst song, but my god, it's close. Where he leans into all that nascent, ugly sourness that runs through so much of one thing at a time, concern troll his ex with a smug presumptuousness that whatever she's doing with her new guy, she is thinking about Morgan Wallen. And there are layers to how ugly the song gets. That electric riff against the creaking acoustics that get warped by that hi-hat and the leaden trap percussion, where Morgan Wallen's voice gets all the more mechanical underneath all the multi-tracking. How he feels bad for the guy, not for her, because she's so obviously doing everything to forget Morgan Wallen, and yet can't quite get his sour, whiskey-soaked memory out of her mind according to him. And then you realize for as much as this song is goading her, the bridge reveals that she ought to be back with him in the miserable clingy mess that persists on, you know, so many other Morgan Wallen songs that came out this year. I mean, there is a way you can read this as being delusional or pathetic, but that would require a daring or self-awareness in which Morgan Wallen is plainly too terrified to show these days. It's not like he wrote this either. Again, the album was 36 songs, and when you have cuts that are not romantic, or interesting, or even particularly edgy, instead of producing this turgid slog, again, tell me why this wasn't on the cutting room floor? And yet, because country and crossover radio got behind it, it was one of his biggest hits this year. Because clearly, ladies, this is the sort of guy you're supposed to want, right? Think on that. Number three. Okay. 
So the next two songs. If I had not expanded my year-end criteria, they would have missed the cut. The next one, we'll have to see if it lasts long enough to scrape onto 2024. I doubt it will. And some might say that despite this debuting in the top 10, it doesn't really count as a proper hit. Hell, most of the time with album bombs, I abide by that logic. A hit is not what it used to be, even if you know all the different ways the Hot 100 has been a rigged game for decades. That being said, you can argue this is Drake at his absolute worst, and the fact that folks let it stick around. I've been blowing through the money like a grown cheese. I've been fucking on a French bitch, say la vie. I just put them on a jet, now they all Italian. Way I'm dressed until I've been to a thousand dollars. This bitch lie about getting shots, but she's still a stallion. She don't even get the joke, but she's still smiling. Every night, late night, like I'm Jimmy Fallon. Crow shoot from anywhere, like you Ray Allen. At this point, it almost feels too obvious to point out everything wrong with this. I'm reminded of every time I've ripped into I'm Upset. The flaws aren't just glaring, they're inexplicable. You sample one more time by Daft Punk and you turn it into downtune slush behind your cheap trap instrumental and then you utterly phone in the attempt to sing along his interpolation about getting blown to end off the song. And after your first four bars, you make the implication that Megan the Stallion lied about getting shot by Tory Lanez. So I don't know why anyone would attempt to side with Tory on this, especially now. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison. He threw shots at you in the 2010s and against Megan the Stallion, who not only tried to cover for Tory at first with the police, but then has faced years of harassment over the shit and she's a better artist than Tory is. And instead you're aligning with the lying, grifting misogynists like DJ Academics and Adam22, who have been trying to elevate Tory as a martyr until he stops getting them clicks. You know, the clout chasing losers of mainstream rap. And Drake's association with them only makes him look incredibly insecure. Especially when it doesn't seem like Megan has the time of day for him for good reason especially now that she's gotten out of her own exploitative record deal drake you would think given everything that's happened with lil wayne and young money you might have some sympathy there but truth be told i don't know how invested drake is in any of this outside of the line that he just knew would get him all this attention the rest of the song is misogyny mob ties flexing 21 making threats and the entire track feeling like a vacuous mess and again if they're playing villains this is the banality of evil, where it's all just crushed into mulch. And literally hours before I sat down to actually film this, Drake released the music video for You Broke My Heart. You know, the worst song on that Scary Hours 3 EP that was the most transparent and insecure attempt to win back all those fans and apparently Joe Budden that I have ever seen. And wouldn't you know, Morgan Wallen was in the music video where women blow up their car because, you know, being in on the ironic joke makes it all better. Go figure. None of that's her loss. Good riddance. Number two. But say what you will about Drake or the incident with Megan the Stallion. It seems to be settled. She's moving on. Drake's moving on. I don't get the impression that he actually really wanted violence upon her. Compare that to this. I woke up on the wrong side of the truck bed this morning with a bone dry bottle of Jack Guys pouring. Damn, she got some nerve when she kicked me to the curb. Guess you could say I got what I deserve. Look, I said my piece about Hardy at length at the beginning of this year, and Wait in the Truck with Lainey Wilson had its run. I figured after the album got critically savaged and he delivered a performance so bad at the WWE that they had to apologize for it, figured as a solo act, he was done. He was going to go back behind the scenes to only annoy those of us who read the liner notes. Then Truck Bed became a thing and I already know the defense. It's a joke song. He drank too much and got thrown out of the house and now he's hungover and angry. He's only getting his gun to shoot the birds that woke him up. It's 2023's version of Eric Church's Jack Daniels. First off, that song actually has a bright hangdog comedic tone to the point where in live shows, Eric Church literally hands out shots of Jack Daniels, the garbage whiskey that it is. But secondly, that would imply there's anything witty or funny about this beyond Hardy getting drunk in his own backyard, falling asleep in his truck, and getting thrown out of the house because the girl is sick of all his bullshit. All paired with guitars that stagger around that whistle until they pick up crunch they frankly do not deserve. Those excruciatingly tinny synths and the underpowered trap skitter. If you want a song that feels like the embodiment of a hangover, it's this one. But that's all being charitable. If I was being 
say less so, I would highlight how the line about the fucking bird catching this 45 could easily be referring to his now ex catching those shots, only amplified by the pitiful excuse for metalcore that passes as the final hook of him getting that final revenge. I mean, it's not that much of a reach here, folks. The music video looks like an outtake from Project X, where the girl is terrified and angry inside the house as she watches the cops join the party and someone getting lit on fire. And again, I'm willing to meet a song that's going for pure unkempt malice halfway, especially where everyone's an asshole. But Hardy can't sell it. His overprocessed drawl barely works when he's rapping, and it's laughable when he tries to build any sort of intensity. It doesn't work as country, it doesn't work as rap, certainly doesn't work as metal. And the fact that this had legs is a truly dire sign, especially if rock radio is desperate enough to platform him, and you know they are. Looks like someone's truck needs a couple tires popped. And finally, number one. It wasn't going to be anything else. We'll try that in a small town. See how far you make it down the road. Around here we take care of our own. You cross that line, it won't take long. More than anything, this is one of those songs I know that will go down in infamy. I already know for a lot of folks it's the clean cut worst of the year, it's not even close. And I said my piece on it months ago. Now it's a turgid, thinly veiled threat of a song that can't even muster much tempo or edge with one promising guitar lick that Jason Aldean can't do a damn thing to optimize. A reactionary song attempting to go to takedown piece, highlighting its dog shit framing of protesters and attempted gun reform. And let's not forget the racist dog whistles by filming that music video in front of that Tennessee courthouse where there's been lynchings and race riots. And I find it very difficult to believe he did not know about that and how in the video with all the pro cop montages given that there was a memorial to there to the victims that the music video location scouting would have found and i could drag out the crime stats of small towns compared to cities site systemic poverty or how the police montage was weirdly international and sourcing all the footage for a song that's trying to be so stridently american or how jason aldean isn't from that small of a town and we should take anything he says about race in good faith given his blackface instance but stop he doesn't care. It would be playing his game to make this more of a spectacle. Does the fact that he didn't write the song mean that it reflects his personal beliefs or character? No, no, no. Stop. Don't open that Overton window. Don't engage with these ideas, especially when he does not seriously think nor care about them. At least Toby Keith had the gall to write his own songs and came to his jingoism organically. In interviews after the song, especially with LA Weekly, it became abundantly apparent that Jason Aldean has never seriously engaged with a lot of the ideas he is selling in his music. Nor has he been seriously required to. Privilege at its core is the freedom to not, to never think think, but he does care about selling to his audience, getting a reaction from the liberal hacks who refuse to engage sincerely with country music, but want this shit to be emblematic of country. That backlash, that controversy, that's what got this ultimately to number one. Not the non-existent merits of the song itself, which Music Row, National Country Radio, they were primed to ignore this as Aldine's career continues to flame out, like anyone who actually covers country would tell you. And speaking of which, the album that contained this song, it was his worst performing since his debut in 2005. If y'all had left this well enough alone, left this to the folks who actually know how to handle bad reactionary propaganda in this space. This would likely have never charted at all, or maybe a week and then gone. You do not have to give this shit oxygen because you need rage bait, especially as Aldean is on his way out. He still is. But y'all made this bigger than it ever had to be. You made country discourse a living hell for anyone actually in the space. That is why I'm angry. That's why it's the worst hit song of 2023. Hopefully y'all might have learned something here. And we can move on. <sighs> so yeah, uh, thanks a lot for watching. If you'd like to like and subscribe, I'd be very grateful. It's hard to do these outros when you get that angry. And again, I still am angry. Because again, how the... the aftermath of what this did to the rest of the year that song and all the dog shit discourse that's why i'm frustrated especially as i know i kind of even played into it by getting as mad as i did but it's kind of hard to get around but i'll never be talking about the song again you know that 
Beyond that, though, if you guys want to subscribe, if you found this entertaining, uh, I mean, if you did, good for you, I guess. But hey, um, I'd appreciate it. Drop some comments, leave your list. I'd be drive up that engagement. If I'm gonna get this angry, it better be friggin' worth it. And if you guys want to get albums on my schedule in the new year, or argue with me on Discord, or just support the channel and be on my merch below, Patreon's right over there. Again, don't feel obligated. Tough times, I understand. Options available. Till then, in the next list to come, I'm Mark. You're watching Spectrum Pulse. I'll see you next time.